Now, uh, in this lecture, we will talk about certain perspectives in sociology, uh, which have been used by social demographers or sociologists of population in explaining population trends. Now, the first point that students of sociology would very much appreciate is that sociological findings are interpretive. A, any student of sociology understands it very well that social phenomena are not uh, having natural laws like laws of physics or chemistry uh, because of subjective meanings and meanings attached to their action by human beings, uh, social findings become interpretive. So, sociologists use certain perspectives, for them perspectives are as important as data and depending on their perspective on society, different sociologists have looked at population growth, advantages, disadvantages of population and implications of population change for different aspects of society in different ways. This includes implications of changes in composition and distribution of population. Now, this lecture covers a few major sociological perspectives on population. Uh, theories of population such as Malthusian or optimum population theory will be covered at a later stage when we are exactly talking about population theory. The purpose of this lecture is only to focus on sociological perspectives uh, in studying population trends. You know uh, that uh, broadly speaking, there are two types of sociological perspectives or there are two types of theories or paradigms or models. Some are called macro, some are called micro. In macro, an attempt is made to explain social phenomenon at aggregate level or societal level, national level, regional level, at the level of caste, groups, means aggregates. And in micro sociology, we try to explain social phenomena at the level of individuals. Then these uh, macro and micro perspectives can further be divided into certain categories. The major categories are in macro perspective, we have functionalism and conflict theory and in micro, we have interactionism uh, or ethno methodology. There are some more advanced uh, perspectives, uh, which we, we are not dealing with in, the, in this course or in these lectures, because population scientists have generally not used them. You know that uh, some of the early theories of sociology were functional in nature, uh, Emil Durkheim, Talgott Parsons or anthropologists like uh, Radcliffe Brown or Malinowski, they use functional perspective. In functional perspective, we equate society with a biological organism and we focus on order, consensus, equilibrium, etcetera. In conflict theory, we look at change and divide society into a number of groups. By and large, sociologists of population and demographers have worked in functionalist perspective. Some sociologists have used Marxist theory. I remember one uh, social scientist. to promotion of contraceptive and reduction in fertility, while Khanna study showed that uh, government strategies to promote contraceptive worked. Mahmood Mamdani was very critical of that theory and uh, he looked at uh, population trends in terms of class structure. So, he used Marxist theory of population. Now, since population is analyzed mostly at the aggregate level, there is very little application of interactionism. Interactionism is micro perspective or hermeneutics or subjective meanings or these things, they come under interactionism. Among the founding fathers of sociology, Emile Durkheim, Max Weber and Karl Marx, it was mainly Marx who wrote on population explicitly, though only to illustrate the point that there is no universal law of population. In this lecture, we are not 
talking about Malthus, but uh, in 1798 in, fun of, in one of the first important works on population, uh, Malthus published his book on the principle of population, an essay on the principle of population, in which he was trying to say that uh, population follows some universal laws or all populations, population of man, animals, plants are governed by some natural laws which we will see later. And uh, Karl Marx said that no, uh, Malthus, uh, Malthus's principles are not applicable to all societies. And uh, he was more interested in uh, demonstrating that Malthusian theory of population was written from a bourgeois perspective that was written to legitimize uh, capitalism or to maintain a status quo while the real causes of population problems or perceived population problems were structural in nature, class division of society, class conflicts or class contradictions. So, Marx was commenting on the population theory of T. R. Malthus uh, and in certain chapters uh, in the capital, Marx's famous book capital, you find detailed discussion of Marx's uh, theory of population, which we will do a little later. Now, at the outset it may be noted that sociology is a relatively new discipline hardly 200 years old and the founding fathers of sociology had little to say on population. In their time population was growing at a very slow pace and therefore, it had no consequence on social structure. When I talk about world population growth, I will show how for millions of years world population remained almost stable and in the last lecture I said that in 1820 for the first time world population reached first billion mark. So, since uh, up to uh, 1820 or even till the later part of the 19th century population was growing at a very, very slow pace. It had therefore, no consequence on other aspects of society, polity, economy or social integration or culture or religion. So, it is natural that sociologists did not have much theorization or much deeper understanding of population trends. In the 19th century, social thinkers could see that in the developed countries, death rates had begun to fall and as a result of that population had started growing. This growth of population started affecting society and economy and this produced interest in studying population. This population society link became a hot subject in the second part of the 20th century means after 1950, when the population of the developing countries start of the 20th century, growth of population was confined to developed countries only and in less developed countries population was either stationary or growing at a very slow pace. So, even in 20th century, uh, theoreticians, thinkers, intellectuals, sociologists did not feel a need to study the link between population and society. But when the population started growing at unprecedented rate 2 percent, 3 percent, 4 percent, some of the Latin American countries grew at more than 4 percent and several Asian countries grew at 3 percent or more, even our own country started growing at 2 percent rate per year. So, at that time uh, population caused certain problems and sociologists took keen interest then in discussing population trends. Now, according to Marx, uh, each historic mode of production has its own law of population. Marx wanted to say that the law of population which is valid for uh, a feudal society is not valid for a capitalist society. The law of population which is valid for capitalist society will not be valid for socialist society or communist society. The law of reproduction valid for capitalist society is not same as that was valid for feudal or ancient societies. Then Emile Durkheim, Emile Durkheim is another sociologist who has written on population trends and impact of population growth on other aspects of society. Not many students of sociology know that. Sociology students know that only T. R. Malthus and Karl Marx have written on population, but there are many sociologists other than Marx also who have written on population issues. 
in uh, Emile Durkheim uh, believed that growth of population increases physical density of population that is number of persons per square kilometer. Physical density of population is defined as number of people per square kilometer. When this physical density increases what he calls moral density this was a term given by Emile Durkheim moral density. Moral density of population also increases. By moral density, Durkheim means the number of interactions between people. Now, for example, if the number of people at a given time is n, the number of 1 to 1 interactions is n c 2 or n into n minus 1 by 2. To give an example, if there are only 2 persons, then 2 c 2 means 1, there is only one interaction, relationship between 2 persons, there is only one relationship. If there are 3 persons, then the relationship number of relationships uh, one to one relationships among three persons will be three C two or three. If the number of persons somewhere is four, then the number of one to one relationships will be four C two or six. And you see this implies that the number of interactions increases much faster than the size of population. So, when physical density of population is increasing, the moral density of population produces a high degree of moral density increases much much faster than physical density and this increase in moral density produces a high degree of competition and anomie. Emile Durkheim was more worried about anomie or normlessness in society. In the western industrially advanced societies uh, they responded by producing division of labor. The division of labor saved society from falling into anarchy at a given state of population. Now, since there was a division of labor, so people performed different types of specialized tasks and in this way they could minimize competition among all sections or all individuals in society. Then uh, there was more competition within the groups rather than between groups. For between group relationship, they had developed interdependence for which Emile Dukheim uses the term organic solidarity. So, Dukheim we may say that uh, uh, he thought that with growth of population there will be change over from mechanical to organic solidarity that is social integration based on homogeneity to social integration based on interdependence between different industrial and occupational groups. This was a very profound observation on the part of a sociologist that in western society when population increase this could have produced anarchy, normlessness, anomie, but because division of labor came to our rescue. So, uh, that so uh, as the diagram shows uh, this diagram is uh, made by me to illustrate what Emile Durkheim wants to say to present Durkheim's views on population may require a more sophisticated diagrammatic representation, but this is just for students of introductory course in population society. The diagram shows that organic solidarity developed in western society because of two reasons population growth and division of labor. Without population growth there is no need for division of labor. Division of labor saved society from falling uh, pre to conflicts and competition or normlessness. Durkheim's contribution to sociology is immense. Durkheim is known as much for sociological theories, this is his theory that uh, population gr growth produced increased moral density and that led to uh, division of labor and then to organic solidarity. But apart from that, uh, Durkheim is known for his uh, contributions to methodology as much as his contribution to theory. Uh, he is the founder of comparative method. His study of suicide shows how multivariate statistical reasoning can be used to draw inferences about social facts like suicide rates. Suicide rates differ from one group of population to another and there are differences in suicide rates between married persons and unmarried persons, urban and rural areas, army men and civilians, protestants and catholic. So, if all these factors determine suicide rate or affect suicide rate, one would also like to know that at a given point of time 
in in history or in a given society which after which factors affect suicide rates more and why uh, and this can be done by using multivariate statistical methods demographers are the biggest users of multivariate methods developed by durkheim recently i read one article in population and development review in which uh, the author tried to explain homicide rates in terms of socio economic and cultural characteristics that reminded me of suicide study of emile durkheim exactly the same way only thing that now uh, that study of homicides uses is statistically much more sophisticated multivariate method than was the case with durkheim's study of suicide now this is an example of how uh, uh, multivariate technique can be used to explain one social fact in terms of other social facts here birth rate is one social fact that may be called the dependent variable because in this study an attempt is made to explain um, increase or decrease or changes in birth rate in terms of other social facts like literacy infant mortality rate income per capita urbanization later on we will see uh, that there is a theory of demographic transition which explains changes in death rates birth rates in terms of urbanization industrialization <coughs> and and economic development uh, when we explain one fact like birth rate in terms of literacy infant mortality income urbanization or other social facts we are basically using durkheim's method of multivariate analysis apart from karl marx and emile durkheim there is another another sociologist whose name should be mentioned although he has not contributed to building theory of population much max weber max weber was more concerned with the relationship between religion and capitalism and although he included population in the factors contributing to industrialization he did not give much importance to this issue yet some people have used his notion of subjective meanings to explore the causes of migration i have seen in some studies of migration which later produce uh, a sub discipline of population studies you may call it phenomenology of migration in which uh, the idea of subjective meanings was used to explain why do in the same condition some people migrate and others do not migrate uh, i would say that among sociologists sorokin uh, gave a more serious thought to population processes in his book contemporary sociological theories sorokin has one full chapter devoted to demographic school in sociology though he is more known for his theory of cyclical change but his writings reflect a durkheimian approach in which one social fact is explained in terms of other social fact sorokin was actually more concerned with uh, cultural or civilizational changes large fundamental changes in culture he say that at one time society was idealistic and reality was supposed to be super sensory super rational then we we are moving to sensate stage in which uh, reality is considered to be sensory and rational and this sensate culture is creating various types of problems for mankind and for development of society uh, he also thought that uh, if this society is to be saved from chaos then we have to develop an ideational culture uh, which will be a kind of combination of idealistic culture and sensate culture now uh, sorokin relates the fact of size and density of population to other social facts he is using two dependent variables one is size of population and another is density of population to what other social facts he relates uh, size and density they are birth and death rates in demographic studies usually birth and death rates are taken as dependent variables but sorokin sometime studies effect of size on birth rate sometime effect of birth rate on size there is a kind of interrelationship between them he studies relationship between size and density with other factors like migration now basically he is trying to say what happens to birth and death rates as size of population increases or as density of population increases we have to distinguish between size effect on birth rate and density effect on birth rate then effect of size and density of population on migration 
effect of size and density on revolution and war. He was worried that excessive growth of population could lead to revolutions and wars. He also examined relationship between size and density of population with economic prosperity, with forms of ownership and possession, with forms of social organization, does population size or does increase in density of population lead to social disorganization, then effect of size and density on political and social institutions, state, family, other institutions of society, inventions and birth of men of genius, modes and customs, then effect and size and density on language, religion, mysticism, equalitarian ideology. Does growth of population promote equalitarian ideology or it promotes uh, authoritarianism? It is an interesting question. You, know, you may agree with Sorokin's ideas or not. It is interesting to read Sorokin on relationship between size and density and some of these variables. And as uh, said right in the beginning that in sociology laws depend on perspectives and laws may change. So, we do not have to agree all uh, we require empirical data to confirm, reconfirm, to falsify, corroborate ideas presented by Sorokin. But one thing uh, cannot be questioned that there is a relationship between size and density of population and all these socio economic political and cultural variables. Ultimately, Sorokin was concerned with whether growth of population will lead to progress or decay of societies. Is it good or is it bad? Is population growth good for society or is population growth bad for society in larger sense, in the sense of civilizational changes. To quote Sorokin, numerous investigators have succeeded in showing the importance and efficiency of demographic conditions in almost all fields of social phenomena. That is why he is talking of so many phenomena, political, cultural, social, structural, modes, customs, wars, violence, conflicts, ideologies. If we cannot say that all these attempts have been successful or quite accurate, we can question them we have to admit that a considerable number of them are likely to be accurate at least in part and some of them are as near to reality as it is possible to arrive in the present stage of social science. Social science is not supposed to be uh, exact science at least in the present stage uh, when Comte thought that sociology will be queen of all sciences. Uh, he also thought that uh, sociology will become queen of all sciences only when it will be possible to understand physical, chemical, biological, political, economic, all processes, all factors, all causes behind human behavior. But that is not the case yet. So, uh, now Sorokin's theory has supplied us with a series of uh, probable correlations. Now, Sorokin is saying that for those reasons, the school has as much right to its existence, school means demographic school, as has any other sociological school. Putting away its mistakes and one sidedness, we may gratefully take its valuable contributions to the science of social phenomena. In recent times, one sociologist who has contributed to building uh, theory of population maximally is Kingsley Davis. Kingsley Davis is a sociologist and some of you may have read his book Human Society, a fundamental elementary and fundamental book of sociology. His perspective is obvious, he is a functional sociologist. Kingsley Davis linked population growth with development and migration. Uh, he thought that there is a positive connection between population growth on the one hand and development and migration on the other. So, growth of population in society uh, is good for development and it is good for migration. Population growth will promote development, population growth will promote migration, population growth will promote industrialization, population growth will promote urbanization. Kingsley Davis is famous for his theory of change and response, also called theory of multiphasic response. 
according to which economic and technological developments and subsequent fall in mortality led to various responses among people which resulted in low fertility. He was referring to situation in country like Japan, where economic and technological developments produce lower fertility. These response, so he wants to know what happened, what happened uh, because of which economic development produce lower fertility. To him these responses include increasing use of birth control, responses means what are uh, the means by which people try to control uh, fertility. The means were increasing use of birth control methods, increase celibacy, celibacy means not marrying or uh, not having sexual intercourse within marriage. So, increase celibacy, postponement of marriage, practice of abortion and emigration. Uh, these are all factors which resulted in lower fertility when society developed. Improvement in mortality in Japan and pre-transitional Europe, here he is explaining why did this happen. So, improvement in mortality in Japan and pre-transitional Europe increased family size. You know at one time when fertility was high, mortality was also high. So, maybe in a family 10 children were born, but out of 10 children maybe 4 or 5 survived. With improvement in mortality, if 10 children are born, 7 or 8 are surviving, 9 are surviving, maybe in some fortunate cases even all 10 are surviving. So, as time passed, people could perceive the stress of increasing family size on family resources. In this context, people started exploring various ways of limiting family size. Now, that mortality has declined, the effective family size has increased and so there is greater stress on family resources and something has to be done to limit family size. What is to be done that Kingsley Davis has already explained, abortion, celibacy, postponement of marriage, abortion etcetera. Davis is a functional sociologist and he shows how disturbance created by one factor of change like mortality. Improvement in mortality was a change and how this improvement in mortality leads to other changes in individual behavior like limiting family size which eventually restore equilibrium in society. So, society moves from one kind of equilibrium to another kind of equilibrium. This can be shown in terms of a diagram. There was a time when like here fertility is high, mortality is also high. High fertility, uh, how fertility, high fertility was sustained or what is the meaning of high fertility, low fertility or high mortality, low mortality that can be debated. High fertility uh, normally when fertility was high 11 to 12 children were born and high mortality means that the average life expectancy was only 20 years. In that situation population was stable, more children were born and more persons died. So, ev eventually growth rate of population was 0, ZPG, ZPG stands for zero population growth. 90 percent time in human history we had zero population growth. Now, uh, with economic development and industrialization mortality started improving. So, we come here low m, low mortality, fertility remains high. It is much easier to reduce mortality than to reduce fertility. Mortality could be reduced by improving health programs, by economic development by creating better labor laws, social security, even economic development and scientific developments would lead to reduction in mortality. But reduction in fertility requires behavioral changes at the level of individual, cultural changes, changes in value systems and therefore, fertility remains. Now, in this period when mortality is low and fertility is high, you have high population growth and eventually when mortality is low and fertility has also declined, low fertility. So, again you have zero population growth. So, we started with zero population growth, there was equilibrium and this equilibrium uh, must have remained in force for uh, millions of years and that is why population did not grow uh, in ancient times. Uh, and in much of 20th century population grew because 
uh, mortality started declining, fertility remained high and gradually as, as more and more development took place and fertility also declined, we, we are moving towards zero population growth. So, from one equilibrium of high high type, we are moving towards another equilibrium of low low type. Uh, this is what Kingsley Davis says, a functionalist as he is, that we are all societies always remain in equilibrium, the nature of equilibrium may however change. Kingsley Davis claimed that his theory is reflexive and behavioral. It is reflexive as it explains individual level changes in terms of socio economic changes and it is behavioral as it explains individual behavior. In the 20th century, Davis has been the most known of all the sociologists for his works in the broad field of population studies. I remember when we were students of population, all of us used to study his framework of intermediate variables in which Davis and Blake have given a list of factors, intermediate factors through which changes in socio-economic sphere uh, cause changes in birth rate or changes in family size. Kingsley Davis also worked on the history, analysis and prediction of populations of India and Pakistan. In addition, Davis has made enormous contribution to measurement of urbanization. He has given various indices of urbanization uh, that includes simple thing like uh, proportion urban or what proportion of population is living in urban areas and weighted indices of urbanization in which uh, higher weight is attached to cities of larger size. Uh, and relationship between urbanization, industrialization and economic development. In the later part of 20th century and now in 21st century, you have a new brand of sociology, it is called postmodern sociology. In the postmodern age, sociologists view that the world has become more complex, fragmented and uncertain. It is characterized by hyper differentiation, a term which is used for excessive fragmentation of society and people. You know, division of labor to which Emil Durkheim was referring to was simple fragmentation. Just to give you an example like uh, initially all knowledge was philosophy and then philosophy got divided into disciplines or subjects like physics, chemistry, social sciences. Now, today uh, social sciences are further divided into sociology, psychology, political science, philosophy and all that, humanity, broad subjects of humanity and social science. There are too many. Within sociology, there is not one sociology, there are so many sociologies depending on perspective and you are familiar with sub disciplines like sociology of religion, urban sociology, family sociology, sociology of education social demography and so on, even in uh, sub discipline like social demography, not everyone is studying same thing. There are sociologists more interested in fertility, there are some more interested in mortality, some in reproductive health and they are not in talking terms. So, and in, the, in this situation when the specialization or division of uh, labor has increased so much that in the same discipline people are pursuing different interests and they are not in talking terms, then they are talking to others in other disciplines. This is the situation of hyper differentiation, excessive fragmentation of society and people, then hyper commodification, rise in consumerism and hyper rationalization, disbelief in science and the idea of truth and emergence of uh, supernatural, mystical, religious mythological and traditional elements. This is postmodern time and postmodern sociologists say that it is not possible to have an essentialist theory of society anymore. It is not possible to have a grand narrative, the term that they use for uh, essentialistic theories of Marx, Weber, Durkheim, Parsons and others that you, uh, today you cannot have one single theory of society which is applicable to all types of societies. So, we can only talk about specific subjects and specific locales, we can talk about Indian society and why, uh, why uh, India, uh, we can still go down further to say uh, Dalits, other backward classes, uh, 
नॉर्थ इंडिया साउथ इंडिया केरला गोवा हिमाचल प्रदेश द सिचुएशन सोशल स्ट्रक्चर्स एंड पॉपुलेशन ट्रेंड्स आर सो वेरी डिफरेंट दैट इट्स ऑलमोस्ट इम्पॉसिबल टू बाइंड ऑल ऑफ दिस डिफरेंसेज इन टू वन सिंगल सजेस्टिव सिस्टम और डेवलप वन सिंगल लॉ देर वॉज ए टाइम वेन अंडर द एजिस ऑफ डेमोग्राफिक ट्रांजेक्शन वी यूज टू से दैट डेमोग्राफिक चेंजेज आर एक्सप्लेन बाई इकोनॉमिक डेवलपमेंट बट देन केम द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ केरला दैट केरला विच हैड लो पर कैपिटा इनकम हैड द लोएस्ट लेवल्स ऑफ फर्टिलिटी एंड देयर इट वॉज एक्सप्लेन इन टर्म्स ऑफ सोशल डेवलपमेंट एंड फॉर ए लॉन्ग टाइम देन डेमोग्राफर्स एंड इन इंडिया एंड आउटसाइड स्टार्ट इट टॉकिंग अबाउट केरला मॉडल ऑफ फैमिली प्लानिंग और केरला मॉडल ऑफ डेमोग्राफिक ट्रांजिशन देन गोवा एंड देन इन कंट्रीज लाइक श्रीलंका इंडोनेशिया मलेशिया इन वेरियस अदर पार्ट्स इट वॉज फाउंड दैट इट वॉज नॉट इकोनॉमिक डेवलपमेंट इट वॉज समथिंग एल्स विच एक्सप्लेन डिक्लाइन इन फर्टिलिटी रेट्स और इम्प्रूवमेंट इन कंटेसेप्टिव प्रैक्टिस नाउ यू हैव न्यू सिचुएशन लाइक द लास्ट नेशनल फैमिली हेल्थ सर्वे शोड दैट हिमाचल प्रदेश इज ए न्यू स्टेट विच हैज ज्वाइन द ग्रुप ऑफ बिलो रिप्लेसमेंट फर्टिलिटी Now, what explains decline in fertility in Kerala? Does not explain decline in fertility in Himachal Pradesh. Then what? This simply means that for different settings, different subjects, different locales, and different historical times, you require different theories and essentialistic theories. Or so postmodern sociologists are saying that we must deal with the problems facing the different vulnerable groups to be valid. it should be of some use to them so the issue is not whether a theory of some something theory of population or theory of religion or theory of exploitation is philosophically or logically valid for some group or not a more important question is whether that theory is of any use to them whether a theory helps in advocating for the interests of some vulnerable group this uh, this also shows that there will be different sociologies or different theories depending on how vulnerable groups are defined where do the uh, the postmodern sociologists interested in advocacy of vulnerable groups focus so vulnerable groups can be say dalit in our context women obcs backward areas remote areas sexual minorities and the problems can also be of different types uh economic political social and you require different types of theories which actually help in advancing in advocating in speaking on behalf of these vulnerable groups uh nobody is interested in mathematical or just uh, universal or scientific kind of essentialistic theories theory must be of some use postmodernists are less interested in grand narratives of social change and transformation they concentrate on piecemeal changes small changes isolated specific changes and emancipation of subjects defined varyingly in different economic social political and cultural terms and they use a term for that little narratives they are more interested in little narratives rather than in grand narratives you know in case of population studies it means that while uh, uh, those interested in grand narratives they want to explain fall in fertility in terms of industrialization and urbanization those who are interested in lit little narratives they would be more interested in how through what mechanism fertility declines in some very specific groups in a particular setting so i was referring to situation in himachal pradesh a theory of fertility decline in himachal pradesh would be a little narrative it will be a little narrative of himachal pradesh postmodernism has been applied to studies of health social stigma feminism constructions of sexuality risk behavior why do people indulge in risky behavior in the context of uh, hiv aids uh, or maybe other situations or environmental movements anti abortion movements ethnicity etc where the focus of studies has been more on individual dispositions and behavior rather than 
macro level or state policies. Postmodernism makes no truth claims about the world and postmodern sociologists have turned interpreters. Now, there are not many postmodernists who are read or who are studied in population literature, but in recent times uh, one uh, intellectual or thinker Bourdieu has increasingly found a place in sociological writings and he, he is also talking about population trends in some of his works. So, among the social theorists who went beyond positivistic sociology of Durkheim, Sorokin and Davis and are more towards postmodernism, Bourdieu focuses on how individuals take an action such as arranging for marriage of children. He says that their strategies are not to be seen in abstraction. You cannot have a law of how people arrange for marriage of children, which is valid universally for all types of societies. They are part of the complex process of social reproduction through which power and privileges are passed on to new generation. For Bourdieu, individuals strategies are more important than rules governing society, while earlier sociologists or functionalists or even Marxists or other conflict theorists focus more on rules governing society. Uh, postmodernists or sociologists like Bourdieu would focus more on individuals strategies. What do individuals do? How do individuals decide their strategies in a given context? This shifts sociologists attention from positivism to dispositions to act. These are the terms that Bourdieu has actually used in his literature, which are constructed through socialization and experiences. So, our dispositions to act, our strategies, uh, our choices, our preferences are part of our socialization and experiences. And that means that in different societies and cultures and settings where socialization and experiences are different, people have different dispositions to act. You cannot generalize for all societies. To theorize about strategies, he gave the concept of habitus. To quote from Bourdieu, Bourdieu uh, defines habitus as quote, systems of durable, transposable dispositions, structured structures predisposed to operate as structuring structures that is as principles which generate and organize practices and representations that can be objectively adapted to their outcomes without presupposing a conscious aiming at ends or an express mastery of the operations necessary in order to attain them. The practical mastery of a small number of implicit principles that have spawned an infinite number of practices and follow their own pattern, although they are not based on obedience to any formal rules. Hence, since these patterns emerge spontaneously, it is unnecessary to make them explicit or to invoke or impose any rules. Habitus is thus the product of very structures it tends to produce, predicated upon a spontaneous compliance with the established order and with the will of the guardians of that order, namely the elders, elders are the guardians of that order. Habitus is the principle that will generate the different solutions, such as the limitation of family size or the emigration or enforced celibacy of younger sons. What do people decide? They decide to limit family size or they decide to migrate or they enforce celibacy on their younger sons, which individuals depending on their position in the social hierarchy, their place in the family's order of birth, their sex and so forth can bring to the practical dilemmas created by the various systems of exigencies that are not necessarily mutually compatible. That means, it is not one factor that determines people's choices. Here are examples, some of them mentioned family's order of birth, sex, social hierarchy, position in social hierarchy. If you apply his ideas to Indian situation, then it means uh, the, the choice that an individual will exercise uh, in the present condition, in, in the present structure uh, would depend 
on what is his caste, what is his community, in which region he lives, what is income, what is social status, education, all these factors affecting his socialization and experiences will determine whether he will migrate from rural to urban areas or he will limit family size or he will do something as uh, to maintain his position. And this leads to structuring or restructuring of society. For board you the constraints of rules surrounding every choice are infinite that since uh, the factors which we consider in exercising our choices are infinite we cannot make a complete exhaustive list of all the factors which affect our choices which affect our behavior then the choices and practices too are infinite it is not possible for any individual to deal with all the norms and make the choices consciously can you ever decide to conform to all norms of society all the times it is not possible so if it is not possible then what the social conditions are like those of fencing and chess and decisions are like parries and moves. So, Bourdieu equates individuals decisions to parries and moves. Postmodern sociologists of population are taking increasingly more interest in the emerging relationship between gender, race, class, religion, media, market and health no wonder that Indian demographers are moving away from estimation of birth rate and death rate or studying causes of migration to issues connected with reproductive health, empowerment of women, gender gap and problems of vulnerable sections of society. With focus on small groups, their risks and dispositions, their advocacy, emancipation of plural subjects and their choices. Plural subject in Marx's writings you find shift from human subjects to class. Now, plural subject means that within classes also on the basis of gender, race, religion, media, market and health there are differences, disparities, inequalities and so the subjects have become more plural. It is no more possible to define subjects only in terms of class. So, with focus on small groups their risks and dispositions, their advocacy emancipation of plural subjects and their choices rather than truth claims, postmodern sociology looks for practical solutions to problems of specific subjects or agency. It is of special interest to sociologists of health. It opposes the biomedical model of health and says that the responsibility for one's health falls on oneself uh, through healthy living. Under the aegis of postmodern sociology, increasing number of sociologists favor qualitative approach, paradigmatic theories and counter structural method. There is preference for understanding subjective meanings in place of positivistic explanation and for this a particular theoretical orientation is chosen without any claim for universalization. Then an attempt is made to ensure that the findings of narratives of various issues pertaining to life such as health and illness are in agreement with the subjects understanding of them. In years to come population studies is likely to take over demography, qualitative methods will take over modeling and theory of vulnerable and marginal groups will take over the mathematical and statistical studies of population and society. Students of population need to be prepared for this. In the following module we will focus on characteristics of Indian society. Now, there are some questions and exercises. I hope that on the basis of this lecture you will be able to answer them like what is the subject matter of population studies, how does the subject of population studies differ from demography, what is doubling time. In the first lecture I talked about doubling time 70 by r. If the rate of growth of India's population declines from 2 percent to 1 percent, what will be its impact on doubling time when the growth rate is 2 percent doubling time is 35 years, when it declines to 1 percent then the doubling time increases to 70 years. Then define total fertility rate, I, I said that you calculate age specific fertility rates, add them that is total fertility rate and that is a better measure of fertility than birth rate. How do demographers do and where do they find employment in NGOs, universities, research institutions and so on. Then you can do a small exercise, select 5 developed and developing countries 
and find out birth rate, death rate, total fertility rate and life expectancy for each of them. Do you see check whether you see a relationship between development and demographic characteristics and you will find that there, there is a relationship. Then you can select a sample of 5 illiterate people married women and 5 graduate married women of the same age, age group from your town. Look at the following at what age did they marry? You will find that uh, there is a relationship between education and marriage age. Uh, educated women are marrying at higher ages than illiterate women. How many children do they have? You may find that educated literate women have lesser number of children, uneducated or illiterate women. It may be of some interest to you if I tell that according to NFHS 3, although, uh, although India has high fertility, and North Indian states have high fertility, UP, Bihar, Rajasthan, West Bengal also rural areas have high fertility. But if you calculate total fertility rate of women who are high school pass, then uh, the total fertility rate among them has already come to replacement level. So, education is important. Which women illiterate or graduate have more say whether education has anything for has any implication for decision making, empowerment and women say in family matters. Are the graduate women working or have any plan to work? Uh, then uh, you can try short notes on Durkheim's views on population and differences between dependency ratio and labor force, causes of low sex ratio in age. I have answered all these things that sex ratio 0 to 6 is declining and that is declining largely because with advancement of technology, improvement in medical facilities infrastructure, improvement in per capita income and cultural uh, changes, dowry, dowry is one factor, sun preference, more and more people are going for sex determination tests and when uh, and if they find that the child to be born is a female, many of them decide to go for feticide. That is how this sex ratio in 0 to 6 called juvenile sex ratio is declining and on the basis of this lecture, try to write a small a note on Bourdieu's concept of habitus. I think it is not difficult for you to write a small note on habitus now. Uh, it deals with choices which are complex, ends are complex, contexts are complex, rules are so many. So, ultimately how on the basis of socialization and experiences people choose what they choose that is the question that Bourdieu is asking and this question can be answered only locally. Thank you.